everyone. We have a special guest on Unapologetic today, but before we get into that, please like and subscribe. I want as many people to find this channel as possible so you know what to do. Now, you're definitely going to recognize our guest for today. You might know him as the CEO of Daily Wire or the founder of Jeremy's Razors and now Jeremy's Chocolate. Jeremy Boring, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Congratulations on the release. Thank you so, so much. And we're going to talk about this Unwoke Inc. documentary that we've released that you've been featured in in just a second. But you've had some interesting news. And I must note that this is unfolding news right now on Twitter, which has just been a complete whirlwind, I imagine, for you today. You released a story about a conundrum that you're having with Twitter about featuring your documentary, What is a Woman, on the platform for free. I want you to get into that. We'll get into Elon Musk's response. And from there, we'll bounce on to other subjects. But please let us know what's happened with Twitter in your documentary. All right, guys, Amelie here had to pop in for a quick update. We filmed this with Jeremy when he was in the midst of the back and forth with Twitter and Elon, and we since have updates on that. So I wanted to update you on what ended up happening. There was a lot of back and forth. At first, they premiered it, and almost immediately, the documentary What is a Woman was labeled as having possibly violated the hateful conduct rules on Twitter. Then Elon apparently got involved and said the documentary is going to show to their followers, but it will not be shown to non-followers and there will not be advertisements then more back and forth ensued and eventually it was shown without any suppression all of the suppression was lifted off of the documentary and elon then tweeted it out and recommended people watch the documentary and have a conversation surrounding what was featured in what is a woman so a very dramatic day for i'm sure jeremy boring and all the other hosts at daily wire but at the end of the day after all of the fighting and going back and forth and saying that this documentary shouldn't be suppressed, the suppression was lifted. So interpret that how you will. Just wanted to give you the update. Well, so we're shooting this episode on June 1st, Thursday, and uh, today is the one-year anniversary of the release of What is a Woman, Matt Walsh's seminal documentary. I think one of the most important pieces of uh, work that we've put out as a company or most important pieces of cultural uh, work in the last year by anyone. And what is a woman really? It just asks the question of our time. What is a woman? Which, you know, would have seemed like an absurd topic for a documentary five years ago and now seems like the, the most important thing we could be talking about. The, the film was a huge success for The Daily Wire. You know, it's been seen by millions of people already. And to celebrate its one year anniversary, we thought, well, what, what could we do better than put the film out for free for 24 hours? Up until now, you've had to come to Daily Wire Plus and become a subscriber in order, in order to see it. So we wanted to celebrate by letting more people see the film given Elon Musk's uh, sort of public commitments to free speech since purchasing Twitter, we thought, well, Twitter will be the perfect platform for this. Obviously, uh, you know, if you, if you use YouTube, if you use Facebook, other social platforms right now, they're incredibly hostile to any conversations uh, about transgenderism or radical gender theory more broadly. Uh, and they'll, they'll tend to you know, de-emphasize, throttle, those kind of, those, that kind of content. So we thought, well, Twitter's the, the exact right place. We went to Twitter, talked to them about this plan. They loved it. In fact, they offered to sell us uh, a fairly expensive block that they offer, which would allow us to have a great viewing experience for our members on this live stream. And for the first 10 hours that the film was available for free on the platform, they would let every single person who used Twitter during those 10 hours know uh, about the live stream. So it seemed like a huge opportunity for us to really get get the word out there about the film and engage in a pretty broad conversation about this really important topic. We signed the IO. We made the deal. Twitter said, hey, send us the, the film. We've never seen it. We're, you know, we know it's controversial, but we want to know sort of what to be prepared for. Still all hands on deck. We sent them the film. They called back and said, whoa, no, we take it all back. You Not only will we not sell you uh, the, the block that we had sold you, but if you put this content on the platform at all, we will label it hateful conduct. We will remove the share button. We will make it, uh, throttle it as part of our speech but not reach program. We said, well, what does that mean? How much are you going to throttle it? They said, well, if, if Matt Walsh puts his documentary on his own uh, Twitter account, his own followers will not see it. That's how much wow. we're talking about throttling it. And we were shocked. I mean, obviously, Elon's been very outspoken about moving Twitter toward being a true free speech platform. Uh, obviously, he's not going to let people engage in illegal uh, activity on the platform. But in terms of political debate, He's been very clear. Twitter had very publicly removed quote unquote misgendering 
which is a really Orwellian term in and of itself, uh, but they had removed that from their policy. And we reminded them of this, you know, and they said, well, yes, we did remove misgendering from our policies particularly, but we still consider it hate speech under other parts of our policy. Uh, and so, again, we were in complete shock, didn't know what to do. We worked with Twitter for the last week to try to, to get them to see why this policy was bad, why it was against sort of their stated and very public uh, uh, commitments to freedom of speech, couldn't get them to move. And so today, unfortunately, I had to sort of make public what had happened. You know, it, there was no way we had announced publicly that we were going to be doing something like this. So there was no way to let Twitter off the hook. I had to address it publicly, and I did so in a 16-tweet thread uh, at 7 o'clock this morning. And as you say, Elon, only a few hours ago, responded, said it was a mistake, said that Twitter was, in fact, committed to being a platform in which these sorts of issues could be debated, said that he didn't agree with the idea of misgendering personally, thought it was rude, but did not think that it was the kind of thing that Twitter should take action against. What will happen next? I don't know. At 8 o'clock uh, Eastern tonight, we're going to air the film on Twitter and see what happens. They they still have not removed, as of the time that we're recording this omelet, they've not removed the warnings that they've already put on the clips. Uh, they've not uh, taken away the throttled sort of traffic uh, as part of their speech but not reach uh, uh, policy. So I honestly don't know. I mean, Elon's response, I'm grateful for it. So far, there's been no action. Hopefully, by the time people see this, that won't be the case. Right. This is such an interesting time to be online and to try to have mm -hmm. these sorts of conversations. And for the audience, you can judge for yourself whether or not you deem this to be hateful content. It was a steadfast response from Elon Musk, which I'm proud of. And I hope the documentary gets to see its time on the platform, because I think there are so many people that deserve to get into the discussion that is brought about in What is a Woman? I want to hone in on a part of Elon Musk's response and sort of extrapolate it to talk about other corporations that are engaged in this sort of activity. He says, this was a mistake made by many people at Twitter. There's this idea that either this corporate wokeism is coming from this hierarchy of ESG and it's being pushed upon the corporations in order to garner more profits. And there's others saying that there are fringe activists working within these corporations that are yeah. allowed to go over the rules that have been stated by the company itself and allow things like what's happened at Twitter to happen. What is your main theory as to what's happening? Because it's not just on, on Twitter, which we have this developing story that we'll update you guys on, but it's Target, it's the Dodgers, it's Chick-fil-A, it's Kohl's, it's ESPN. We have hundreds of examples of this happening right now. What do you think the main source of these woke campaigns is? Well, I, I think main source is actually, I don't know that there's a main source. I think that we've, uh, you know, we've allowed an entire generation to come of age believing this nonsense, and now they're entering the workforce. They're making their voices heard. Because we've spent the last 25 years really developing this very litigious HR culture in our country, people who own and, and operate these organizations are very afraid to stand up to 22-year-old interns. They're very afraid to stand up to, ironically, their least valuable uh, employees. And so as a result, we just see this, this virus really spreading at an alarming rate. Do I think that ESG contributes? Absolutely. Do I think that there's a, a sort of top-down conspiracy uh, to infiltrate corporate America with these ideas you know, from organizations like Black, uh, BlackRock and others? Uh, yes, absolutely. Do I think that that's the sum of it? No, I think that it really is coming from all different angles. You know, you take a privately owned company like Twitter. Well, the, you know, Elon Musk isn't uh, allowing this to happen at his company because of some nefarious ESG plot. Uh, he may be sensitive to the fact that advertisers do an awful lot. You know, advertisers are inherently risk averse. They do an awful lot to enforce this kind of stuff. He may also just be dealing with sort of holdover employees from the old regime that he hasn't been able to clear out that I would say that that's somewhat what's implied by uh, his response. But you look at some of these other organizations, and I'm not sure. Some of them, I think, are true believers. You know, there's no other explanation for why Target would do the things that Target's doing. That's not just corporate policy that's playing out. It's an actual corporate strategy to very publicly, in a very forward-facing way, um, you know, pander to the worst elements in society. And in com companies like Chick-fil-A hiring this head of you know, DEI to work for the company, mm -hmm. you know, Chick-fil-A also, you know, I believe a privately held company. So I don't think that that's some giant ESG plot. I think that it's just you hire people into these roles and they wind up having pa power inside of your company. It really is, uh, you know, it's a multi-front 
battle for anyone who's trying to keep this out of their organization. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are overwhelmed. One of the main comments that I get when we talk about these companies is, I don't know where to shop anymore. I don't know yeah. where to go. Everywhere I go, there is something happening and there's another company to stop supporting. And we go through this idea in this new documentary that's out now called Unwoke Inc., which you are featured in. And I'm wondering what your prescription is for people who are sharing this concern of being overwhelmed. And we, we watched a boycott happen with... Bud Light that was widely successful among conservatives and just anti-woke individuals here in the United States of America. Is that the no. future for these corporations who are coming out with this messaging? Well, I, I, want, I want to celebrate what happened. You know, the right did mobilize against Bud Light in a major way. You know, I think that Bud Light as a brand may actually be finished. So you can't go into a bar today and order a Bud Light. Uh, you'd be afraid of what other people would think about you. You, mm. you, you look at the store shelves. Uh, and all the beer was sold out for the Memorial Day weekend, except Bud Light. I think real damage has been done to that brand. But was it a successful boycott? Well, that's a different question altogether. I mean, the Bud Light used to be the number one beer in the country. As of this morning, it's Modelo, which is owned by the same company, Anheuser-Busch. Mm. So did we actually extract uh, any damage from Anheuser-Busch? It doesn't appear so. It seems like we just transferred uh, the revenue from one part of their business to another. Another interesting detail, though, that I do think that we can learn something from, from the Bud Light controversy is this. Just as Bud Light's uh, revenue dropped by 25%, Coors's revenue increased by 25%. Or not their revenue, I apologize, it may have been their market share. What does that say? It says that in order for a boycott to be successful, there actually has to be a readily available alternative. If there's not a readily available alternative, you're not going to get a successful boycott. People cannot stop shopping at Target because they have to shop somewhere. In order to have an effective boycott against Target, you need Walmart not to be woke. And unfortunately, Walmart is very woke. It didn't used to be. It used to be one of the great conservative companies in the country. It is no longer. So I think one of the most important messages that I try to get out there to, to conservatives is you have to start businesses. You have to create those alternatives. You know, if, if there were an alternative, to target today, that alternative would be thriving and a boycott against Target would be successful. If we owned a conservative beer brand, it would be the thing that was really growing and increasing right now, instead of just other beers that are owned by the same very small handful of mostly woke companies uh, being the beneficiaries in some ways of the boycott. It's really just a, it's really just a shell game at this point of, uh, for them, not a successful boycott in the final analysis. We have to be creative. We have to build a future. And if we do that, then I think we can be very successful with boycotts. And I know you you may not be a, a fan of, of making predictions here, but what you're speaking about sounds to me like what many have theorized, a parallel economy of people just going to companies that support their values and things sort of split. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be the, the end all be all of what's happening with corporations and companies? We just go to our separate camps or is there going to be a time where we as companies decide, you know what, we're just going to do what we set out to do and it's to create X, Y, Z product and sell it to the American people? Right. Well, obviously no one knows the future, right? But I would mm -hmm. say this, that if we create alternatives, it can be very lucrative for us, which you know we've, we've played out here at The Daily Wire with the success of some of our alternative startup brands, still, still nascent, but already making eight figures worth of revenue uh, every year. But what I really think is that if you take enough market share away from some of these major corporations, you might change their behavior. And if we think about a company like Disney, Disney has the greatest content library ever created in the history of man, the, the best IP, the, the best creative content that has ever existed uh, in mass exists at Disney. It would take us a century to replicate it. That's how long Disney has had to create it. So if we had one century and beat the odds and were above average in our creation and fortune favored us, we might get to where Disney is 100 years from now. Wouldn't a better goal be take 10% of the market share away from Disney over the next 10 years and force them to bring that content library back into play for the broad middle of America. We, we may still have to put up with some things that we don't like, but if we can take them off of this incredibly radical path where they're actually promoting transgenderism to children, which is, I mean, it should be criminal. That's how far Disney has strayed. But if we could bring them back to a more central place, then we could have something else that America needs. Because do we need alternatives for conservatives? Yes. But what we need the most to survive as a nation is a common culture, a cultural space that isn't purely 
political, that isn't completely bifurcated. I happen to think that the best way to do that is to further bifurcate economically right now. But mm. my goal isn't just the conservative shop uh, at Jeremy's Razors and liberal shop at Harry's Razors. My goal is that Jeremy's Razors does incredibly well, and it either becomes the place where all Americans can shop or it forces Gillette at all to become a place, once again, where all Americans can shop. I love to hear you say that because I think a lot of people are, are losing hope and they're thinking that mm. these companies are never going to respond to the grievances that they have right now. And of course, you've responded to that not only in uh, the press and media that you've created, but in the companies that you're continuing to create. What's next for you? <laughs> you got Daily Wire, Jeremy's Razors, Jeremy's Chocolate. You're, you're creating alternatives all over the place. So, so where do you go from here? Well, at seven o'clock, uh, I'm sorry, it's six o'clock tonight. Uh, we're, I'm hosting the Twitter live space for What is a Woman. We'll see what happens with it. And then at 8 o'clock, I'm shooting the first scene for the next Daily Wire Plus feature film, which I'm not at liberty to say any more about than that, but it's a huge undertaking. And then leaving the country for six months to shoot our Pen Dragon series. So we're really all in on this entertainment content right now, launching our children's entertainment later this year, which I'm very proud of. Um, other retail brands, you know, Jeremy's Razors is a great uh, grooming company for men. It seems like there's, you know, 50% of the population who might also like a nice <laughs> conservative grooming company. So hopefully we'll have something to announce about that very soon. I would say this one last thing though on the topic, which is you, you speak to the hopelessness that people feel, and that is certainly true. Uh, I, I feel like there's a real malaise in the country, especially since the midterms. A lot of people are giving up on the future. And the thing I'll say about that is that's a fool's game. There will be a future. If you give up, then there's certainty about what that future will be. If you fight, if you stay motivated, if you stay in, uh, engaged, well, we don't know what the future will be, but at least we'll have some sort of say in what it might be. And it's just the only way to actually exist in this world, the only way to actually find happiness in this world. Your happiness can't be in victory because victory isn't assured. Your happiness has to be actually in the fight and pouring out your best efforts and trying to build a world that you that represents the values that you believe in. And so don't don't let yourself fall into malaise. Be of good cheer. Be a happy warrior. Get out here and do something. Uh, and I think that that's any other way is just madness and despair. This is the only way uh, to actually have a chance at winning. I think that is a beautiful message to end on, Jeremy. And thank you so much for being here. I would love to talk to you more. But if you're watching right now and you want to hear more from Jeremy, he is featured in our newest short documentary at PragerU.com titled Unwoke Inc., where he goes into his business endeavors and his everyday activity in creating alternatives, not only for conservatives, but just for rational individuals who are done dealing with the wokeness that we're seeing right now in corporate America. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you.